Welcome to the Neutral Podcast, where we discuss paving the way to a sustainable tomorrow. I'm Nate Helbach, your host, founder, and CEO of The Neutral Project, a sustainable real estate development company. Join us each week as we host world-renowned guests and explore dynamic landscapes of real estate development, alternative investing, sustainability, forestry, urbanism, and new cutting edge carbon neutral construction materials that are shaping the cities of tomorrow. Welcome back to the Neutral Podcast. Today I'm joined by Ray Hartshorn, who is partner of Hartshorn and Plunkard Architects, HPA. HPA is the Chicago-based architectural practice with a focus on mass timber and heavy timber, and that they are designing the world's tallest mass timber building in the world, hopefully. Uh, with our firm, The Neutral Project, and we're planning to break around on that this year. And one of the partners is Ray, who I have on today, and I'm very excited to talk to Ray about the history of uh, HPA, the history of mass timber, and then we're going to touch on a little bit of vernacular architecture and classical design. Ray, thanks for coming on the episode. Honored to have you here. Maybe you could uh, start off with just a little background on yourself and kind of how you got started in the industry and how you got into uh, starting your own firm. Uh, thanks, Nate. It's great to be here. Yeah, you know, um, I'm here in Chicago. I'm, I'm actually in a timber uh, stables building. Uh, you can't tell that right now. I think you know that. Um, I'm a Chicago guy. I was born on the north side uh, in the Rogers Park neighborhood. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been proud to be a part of, you know, a world-class architecture city. Uh, I found myself um, in uh, going to graduate school here at UIC. That's where I met my uh, business partner, Jim Plunkard. And, um, you know, the the thing that was a real influence us there with us there is that we studied under architects like Tom Beebe. They were Chicago 7 architects. And the Chicago 7 came together to rebel against uh, Miesian design by copycat architects that were, were abusing that and um, making buildings look a lot uh, more repetitive and cold and, uh, you know, they sort of lost their soul. And uh, so Tom Beebe encouraged us to look to the past, the best buildings and the best architects of the past for, for inspiration. And at that time, he brought in his good friend, Alan Greenberg. Alan Greenberg was a great American classical architect, and he taught Jim and I the, the classical language of architecture, which is rooted in human proportion and the proportion of the Greek and Roman columns, like the Ionic and Doric columns and such. Um, and so it's something that has carried through our work. Um, shortly after uh, grad school, we uh, opened our own practice, Hartshorn and Plunkard, uh, right near here in the basement of the Blue Point Oyster Bar. And uh, we started out just as rehabbers, rehabbing small buildings around town, and uh, eventually met up with real estate developers that were willing to take a risk on renovating larger buildings, like very large loft buildings. Um, by the um, late 80s, early 90s, we were design, uh, renovating, designing and renovating some of the largest buildings in the city of Chicago, if not the country. You know, for example, the old Butler Brothers Warehouse on the Chicago River, which is a million square feet. And as young architects, we were converting those to office and residential. And that, during that time, in the early 90s, when I, I had my first shot at timber, because um, a lot of um, heavy timber loft buildings were becoming available as companies moved out of town. Um, and uh, we um, we started renovating heavy timber, which is the predecessor material. Uh, it's the predecessor 
construction type to mass timber, which we're doing today quite a bit. Um, and, and, and heavy timber, um, we, we did so much of it. I think we've, we've done over a million square feet of heavy timber renovation in Chicago. And, um, wow. what I, what I, what I tell people when I talk about my career in, in t- um, timber construction is I met when I first started that I met a lot, it, it came with a lot of resistance. It was not accepted as a good material. Um, and so I've, um, my whole career, I've spent persuading people that no wood is fantastic material. In fact, uh, whenever I went to city hall or the building department to appeal certain code issues, I was asked to show equivalency between timber and steel and concrete. And, um, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of info in America at that time. Um, so I used Canadian codes. I used archaic material charts. I, I supplemented new, um, bioprotection systems and I, and I, and I got my projects approved, but I learned a lot about timber and, uh, I, and I thought maybe the use of timber was done with by the late nineties, but little did I know that mass timber was being developed in Austria and Scandinavia at that time. Yeah. And, uh, what I should say is mass timber and heavy timber, the properties are essentially the same. You know, if you went into a building that had a brick exterior and the insides would look similar, wood columns and beams and ceilings. Um, their properties are, are very much the same. The difference is that heavy timber was milled monolithically from logs. They're solid pieces, whereas mass timber is made from smaller wood studs glued together under pressure to make those bigger. Um, and the uh, mass timber industry in Austria and Scandinavia was taking dead aim at the construction market for large scale buildings that, and, and that's what we do. We, we do strictly large scale real estate. We're from our studio in Ch- Chicago. It's our only office, but we practice all over the country from coast to coast. Um, we're in like 25 states, um, doing the same thing, renovating heavy timber building, designing new mass timber buildings inspired by those vintage buildings, and to try to create a wonderful context for our projects. And um, so, yeah, that takes us... That's, that to, takes us to yeah. the, today, basically. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things I want to touch on, Ray, to start off with for the audience is just kind of the history of timber through your lens, but also just kind of the history of timber going back all the way to 700 AD when they were using timber to build Japanese temples over in Japan and then bringing it over to the U.S. So maybe you can give us just kind of like uh, a 10 minute lecture, I'll say, on the origins of heavy timber. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... uh when I would go to the building department and fire department in Chicago and get a lot of resistance, I would say to myself, you know, they, they, they have a hangover from the fire, the great Chicago fire of 1871. They really can't accept timber. They can't accept it as a quality material. And you, you, you've probably heard this. Um, people talk about wood they well woods should be for like little single family homes you know it it's got some bad properties it it rots you know it burns um it's not great um and i realized you know i have to explain to people wood used properly is unbelievable you you've got the oldest some of the oldest buildings in the world are timber buildings um, there's evidence of wood buildings from 10,000 years ago. Wood may be the oldest building material on the planet if, if you didn't live in a desert, if you lived near trees. Um, and yeah, um, the oldest existing building is a temple in Japan uh, built around 7, 
700 AD, still used today, um, 1,500 years old about, you know, I'd say wood performed pretty well in that case, you know, um, and uh, it carries on. I mean, you, you could, um, there's different types of uses of timber, you know, we've, we've talked about it, post and beam, you know, that was prevalent in the Middle Ages, but in the Middle Ages in Europe and Scandinavia, millworking, woodworking was being perfected. And so you have some of the oldest buildings there still around. And I talk about um, Notre Dame Cathedral, and, and I talk about it because everybody knows Notre Dame Cathedral, and you may have heard that they had a fire um, that destroyed their timber roof and spires, their iconic spires. Um, the the great thing is, that, and I and I blame I don't blame the wood for that fire, by the way, just a lack of uh, um, by a good modern fire protection. But they've been able to go find a hundred year old oak trees in the forests of France, ship them to the site, mill them, and rebuild that building exactly as it was in eleven hundred A.D. You know, so you have. That speaks to the versatility of timber and the longevity. And when you take care of it, it lasts forever. Um, and I like to talk about that because there's a lack of acceptance and it's um, relegated to second class. Um, so I give props to the Far East, to, the, um, to Europe and Scandinavia. But you, America plays a role in developing timber framing that is one step away from mass timber, which we're using today. And uh, so the earliest settlers to America, they found plenty of trees. I mean, half of the America was covered in trees. And they had framing skill, milling skill from Europe. Uh, CNN ran a story a few years back um, about this new mass timber trend that we're having. And they said that the first mass timber building in America was a log cabin. And, you know, when you think about a log cabin, you think about, well, those logs are heavy, and that's hard to build with hand tools, right? Um, so um, the lumber industry started coming up with ways to frame in with lightweight uh, framing. And an early technique was called balloon frame. The thin, thin wood studs spaced apart and went from floor to roof. And by the 1850s in Chicago, there were a lot of balloon framed buildings in Chicago, built very close together, by the way. And we all know what happened in 1871. A small fire broke out, the wind was blowing, and these buildings went up like matchsticks and destroyed half the city. Um, so what I didn't realize um, until I started renovating heavy timber buildings and looking at the background of heavy timber is that there were insurance companies that had suffered fire loss. The great Chicago fire, there were fires back east in New York, and they said, wait a second, we are not going to provide insurance for your projects, not unless you file some rules. Okay, so if you're going to build with wood, they better be big pieces of wood, big timbers that are butted together, no space between them. And they had other rules about um, a height and area. And they said, if you follow these rules, we will provide fire insurance. And they called this construction methodology fireproof construction. That was the invention of heavy timber. And isn't it funny to hear the hear wood construction called fireproof? Yeah, that was the invention in the 1880s. Um, heavy timber was being perfected. You got 1900. It was the height of the industrial age, right? A lot of growth westward towards Chicago. We had uh, we had the Northwoods of Wisconsin, where where you're from. We had lots of trees that would yeah. bring down. And um, now timber buildings, loft buildings, um, were relocated, that was relocated to 
more modest building type, like a warehouse, like a factory building. Those has, had to be economical. So, uh, the, and those buildings were built along the river to pick up and deliver supplies or along the rail yards. It happened in Chicago. It happened in Rust Belt cities across the country. Um, those were heavy timber buildings. Now, steel and concrete was being perfected, uh, especially for the rail uh, railroads. Um, and it was those materials were relatively expensive, and they were relegated to the most important buildings in town. You know, Class A office buildings, um, institutional buildings, cultural buildings. Um, I call those high classical buildings. Um, the low classical buildings, traditional buildings, were brick and timber loft buildings made of heavy timber, which is fireproof, by the way. And why? Because at the time, they knew of the superpower of a tree, that superpower property of wood, which we know of as char. And uh, I didn't realize it, but as I, back in the 80s, 1980s, when I talked about char, nobody knew what I was talking about. And I said, well, of course you know what char is. If you sat by the fireplace or a campfire, you, you see the blackened charcoal around the perimeter of the log. That's the effect of charring. And, and I said, um, did you ever wonder how a great sequoia has lasted a thousand years and survived forest fires? Well, because of char. Because when that forest fire envelops the bark, the fire disintegrates the wood fibers. And what have you done? You've eliminated the fuel for the fire. So that sequoia puts out the fire by itself. Um, and the, the char was known by the Japanese uh, a thousand years ago. Um, they call it the shugaban uh, sh technique. Um, they, would, um, they would pre burn the shingles and the siding on their homes. And you can imagine these blackened um, siding going on. What does it do to their house? Well, it makes it fire resistant for one thing and uh, also resistant to decay. Um, so you've got these, um, what's interesting about char nowadays, like, you know, we're working in mass timber. Mass timber is small pieces of stud glued together. That's been tested. Mass timber's been tested. It's um, um, mass timber chars at the exact same rate as monolithic heavy timber at one inch per hour. Um, so um, very predictable. And the great thing about wood in a fire, and we've done testing recently um, that shows how well um, timber performs in fires, it doesn't collapse immediately. It it burns and it chars. And like if you want if you want a timber building to have the equivalency of like a concrete column that is two hours rated, well you take the wood, you size it to the structural dimension that you need, then you add another two inches for the two hours, and that's your final column size to build the building with. And two hours is a long time. It allows you to get out of the building, right? Exit the building, and it allows the fire department to come and put out the fire. Um, and I use these arguments when I first started renovating buildings in Chicago, and fire department was like, uh, I don't know if we really want to do this. I mean, fire, you know, um, heavy timber was restricted to four stories. Um they didn't like the idea of expanding it, um, uh, and um, but if you if you um, take the superpower of trees, like like the char, and how fire resistant it is, and then you think about all the other great superpower the tree has, like creating oxygen for us, um, renewing itself. It's one thing steel and concrete can't do; can't renew itself. Yeah, um, exactly. You think, uh, wow, this maybe 
this is a building material that deserves a little respect, right? Yeah. I think that's something that people don't realize as much as they should that, you know, with, and it's interesting that you say that steel and concrete back in the 80s and 90s was kind of the premier material to use because uh, I feel like the it switched big time. And now what is kind of the premier material to use? I mean, just your guys' office, you know, you guys sit in one of those old warehouses that probably used to be used for storage or something. And now it's your guys' office and it's a premier space. But it's kind of interesting to see the life cycle of both heavy timber, but now mass timber, uh, just in your own career. How, uh, one, one question I had for you, Ray, after that really nice history lesson, um, is how did the Chicago fire affect Chicago building code? Cause I know that, and I don't know if all the listeners are aware of this, Chicago doesn't follow the traditional IBC building code. They have their own building code actually. And I think that's a direct result of the Chicago fire, but you practice there. So I'm sure you have a little bit better insight. Um, I think it just, um, it's a very restrictive code in the sense that, um, they wanted to restrict height and area. Um, I don't know exactly, um, how they determined, you know, what four stories and 60 feet would be and why that would be a maximum you know, um, or heavy timber. Yeah. For heavy timber. Um, there's, there's some exceptions where you can go up to five stories or six stories that, that, that hadn't changed. It didn't change for like 80 years. I mean, when I started in 1987, the Chicago code was still relegated heavy timber to, um, type four construction. Um, Whereas, you know, steel and concrete are type one. Um, so relegated it, lots of restrictions on height and area. Um, and whenever we had to try to expand a use, maybe do an addition, uh, an extra story, we had to go to their appeal through their appeal process called standards of the test and we had to prove it out. Um, I think I'm one of the first people in Chicago that got parking approved in a heavy timber building. In the early 90s, um, we were doing a lot of condo projects where residents needed parking on site and they wanted parking garages in the timber buildings. Um, That was a big battle. We ended up, in the end, not even using the integrity of the wood. Um, We... Um, we were required to put four layers of drywall on the ceilings of all garages. That's an um, immense amount of drywall. It's like four hours of of rating. Exactly. And uh, we we couldn't do an ordinary sprinkler system. It had to be a high-rise sprinkler system monitored by the fire department. Um, But, you know, that's we still encounter that kind of thing today. We call that fire protection enhancement to even with mass timber. But as you know, and we'll get to that, um, the building code has become more liberal when it comes to timber. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to hear that for you to put four layers of drywall. I think well, we got it done. It was expensive. Yeah. We it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, shifting into our next segment here, just about the reuse of heavy timber buildings. I think you kind of saw this initial big push for heavy timber of construction. And then you also saw the reuse of a lot of these buildings in Chicago go from kind of industrial to office or even residential. And I'm just wondering like, why, why do you think people are interested in reusing heavy timber? And I mean, obviously the sustainability um, of reusing a building is like the most sustainable, sustainable thing you can do. But why, why do you think people are interested in reusing these type of buildings? Yeah, um, well, it it's taken a while, I think, for people to get comfort, comfortable with it. Um, you know, um, companies, factories, warehouses move to the suburbs to be in long-span steel and concrete buildings that left these buildings available for renovation. Um, 
that a lot of people did not want to get involved in, again, it goes to acceptance and perception of these buildings being secondary uh, at first. You know, I had clients, developers that didn't want to touch that with a 10 foot pole. I had, we had big general contractors that didn't want to get involved in renovating wood buildings. Uh, even architects didn't want it. Um, and, and I think, and this is what I think we're good at when we, um, HPA is we find ways to solve real estate problems, um, and show people that things work and they look good. And then we move forward from there. Um, so yeah, I mean, we had, we had gotten some success in our preservation projects. Um, we've renovated and preserved hundreds of buildings. We put, you know, a couple dozen buildings on the national register. Um, and during that time, um, I think people were seeing the beauty of these buildings from a historical standpoint. Um, not just loft buildings, which have a simple elegance to them, but um, even buildings from the 20s and 30s that were, um, you know, um, going dark from their previous use, like downtown office buildings um, or, you know, the Chicago Athletic Club on Michigan Avenue, which we converted to a hotel and restaurant, you know, um, eventually we were converting like manufacturing buildings like the Alice building in, in Fulton Market to the Du Soho House. Um, so uh, there was, I think the appreciation for renovation in Chicago became, it came in the 90s. These were less expensive properties to get into from a real estate development standpoint. Um, and tenant, tenants and residents could probably get in at a lower price point. So the combination of um, the economics of it and the beauty of it um, uh, started an awareness of, of how wonderful these buildings are. And that, you know, I think the real, the real turning point was the year 2000, I'll call it the millennium. Um, I don't, I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, but that I think was a huge change in sensibility, um, that occurred. We had, um, you had a new generation for, for one thing, and you talked about the, you talked about the sustainable as aspects of, you know, heavy timber buildings, lot buildings. Um, we weren't aware of it as much back in the 1980s and early 90s. We did appreciate the fact that we weren't tearing down buildings and building new. We called it preserving the embodied energy of a building. We didn't quite make the jump to carbon at that time. Um, but in, in 2000, you have a new generation that started looking at the world differently um, with a lot of concern, and rightly so. I mean, I'm, I'm a baby boomer. I'm on, I'm on my way, way out, you know. I don't, uh, maybe it wasn't a big concern for me, uh, but now, been, you know, my daughter was born in 2000. She's a millennial. Um, I'll, I'll lump you in with the millennials, Nate. I mean, what's great about what you're doing is you're thinking about where this planet is he headed, and it's not looking great right now, not just for you, but for your kid, you know. Um, yeah, we had a much heightened awareness of the carbon issue as it related to global warming, and um, that that was a, way, a path to acceptance of wood as being, hey, you know what, we can look past the old thinking about wood if it's a pathway to cooling the planet with its superpowers, um, the trees, and um. The other cheerleader for timber in 2000 were tech companies. It was a asset classification that never existed um, before the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, coincidentally, um, young startup companies in the late 90s had moved into heavy timber buildings to start their practice, economical buildings in New York and Chicago and big cities. 
and they fell in love with them. They liked the high ceilings. They liked the wood. They liked the craftsmanship. And, um, you know, I, I talk about this because, you know, I've worked on the Google headquarters in Fulton Market, which is the conversion of the um, Fulton Cold Storage Building, 350,000 square feet and plus addition. Um, we've done a number of, um, we've done tenant work for tech companies. We did T3 at, at Atlanta, which is tech timber and transportation. It's um, Heinz development there their model, and Heinz, one of the largest office developers in the world, um, you get a sense, at least I did, that um, tech companies came into 2000 loving heavy timber buildings and um, finding this new framing technology called mass timber and being very accepting of it and saying, it can, it, we have the same values mass timber represents a path forward for sustainability and lowering the temperature of the earth. And by the way, maybe it's a reward for our employees that are tethered to the computer, the virtual world all day long. I've always found it a fascinating contrast where you have internet employee working in the virtual world, tethered to their computer. Um, now you have AI, which brings into question authorship. But when you're in a timber building, there's no question. These wood, this wood frame was put together by hand, by people. And um, the authenticity, now it's, I guess, a buzzword in design, authenticity. Um, it was just it seemed like a natural kind of a perfect storm where you had um, big tech, which never existed before, employee-centric, um, looking to improve the environment, creating creating amenities for their people, creating beautiful spaces to enjoy. And it was very, very accepting of mass timber when it came along in, the, in 2000. Yeah. So it was all these kind of large factors of almost birthing a whole new asset class of office tech space. And this is what they, they chose, which is interesting. And I think it's also cool how you guys called it embodied energy before the term embodied carbon was around, which uh, we've talked a lot about on the podcast before. But I think one of the things we've talked about is looking at you know old buildings and trying to find a reuse for them is really the most sustainable thing you can do because of, you know, these life cycle analysis that we run in house, we look at them and say, okay, our buildings are probably going to last longer than typical buildings, which is like 50 years. We'll probably be at 75, maybe a hundred, but even at a hundred years, it's like, they're going to get probably taken down and hopefully we can reuse some of the components, but not the whole building. And so it's, I mean, great whenever you can go into these old 1920 and 30s heavy timber buildings and say hey let's leave the structure up and let's find another purpose and it sounds like what you guys have done a lot with a lot of the stuff you have in full market which maybe that's a good transition into talking a little bit ray about some of your projects in fulton i know you guys have done probably more than half of that redevelopment and I think it's, I mean, it's an amazing spot if you are in Chicago uh, and are wanting a good spot to go check out Fold Market. But Ray, maybe you could just highlight a few of the projects you've worked on there. Yeah, well, um, one night we um, we renovated an old boat trust storehouse there. That was our stu studio on Fulton Street. And that was uh, when it was primarily a meat market running ragged you know, pushing meat carcasses through the street, no sidewalks. Again, this is, you know, we were a startup company, wanted something economical. We were rehabbers, so it wasn't that difficult. We we repaired the, the wood trusses and such. Um, the good thing that the city did there is they um, created a historic district. Because as, if you've been there recently, you know, wherever the adjacent 
all the adjacent land has been bought up and things are are getting very dense and very tall there um and um you know there's a there's an l stop that didn't exist it was um at, at um Oregon and they reinstalled it and so you had um great raw material there you had had a had, you had continuity you had working class timber and masonry buildings side by side and and that just sets up great to be a walkable community um you know i mentioned that we did the soho house we did google um that was a pivotal project because um sterling bay had had bought that in um early 2000s and um nobody knew what to do with it that that building had five foot thick you know ice packs inside it had to be thawed and um we had to cut holes in the building like swiss cheese so that the building didn't crack when we thawed it um uh but it you know rehabbing takes a lot of ta- tenacity we, we had it i mean we we've we've done it um our whole career and we still do it um the the things that we've done is we have uh, been inspired by the historical context of a site. So we we look at the context, we get inspired by that. A lot of it's traditional building, and as I mentioned, we've, we've been trained in traditional design. Um, so a lot of what we do is renovate an existing structure, like an existing heavy timber building, and make it brand new for the new user. And then if there's a vacant site, we build a new building or a mass timber building that is inspired by that old building. So it creates a nice context. It has a nice human scale, walkable. Um, I give you the example of the new Herman Miller show row. It's about 1200 West on Fulton. If you go over there, it's a fun space. It was originally an A distribution factory. Um, which was abandoned. We we got renovated it, um, and uh, Herman Miller needed administrative offices, so we built a four story addition and made it seamless with the brick color, and then we added a glass uh, showroom on the rooftop, an event space for them. Cool. Um, yeah, we we've, we've done about forty projects. Um, throughout the market, um, from Halstead, where we did 900 uh, brand new uh, loft loft look, 900 uh, West Fulton, uh, where Noel Furniture is, their headquarters is, and um, uh, like I said, half the buildings all the way down Fulton. Uh, some of them, which which are uh, some great restaurants, you know. Yeah. It's definitely turned into like the restaurant corridor. Yeah. Or Chicago, which is yeah, great. Joe Joe Flam, Flam uh top chef guy, um, is in our um building at nine twenty nine uh Bolton that we got renovated. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, I'll have to check that out next time we down there. Yeah, I know, Rosemary. Uh, it's Rose Rosemary the name of it. Yeah. Okay. And I'll have to check it out. Um I know, Ray, that kind of switching into outside of Chicago and some of your practice across the United States, um, you guys are working on another Sobo house in Nashville that maybe you could just touch on kind of what you're doing there and how it relates or doesn't relate to what you've done in Chicago with Heavy Timber. Yeah, well, it relates a lot. I mean, one of the things that we we did just as a tangent point to this is in 1998, we we started our own interiors group within our company because uh, we knew that we could help improve the experience of the building of the of the user of the building, not just renovate the shell of the building, but to the interiors. And we wanted with our interiors to bring maybe some poetry to the building, like interiors that tell a story, maybe about the site. Um, and we do a lot of research when we start a project. 
Look at the Edison, for example. When our preservation group got done examining the uh, historic sandboard maps, what did we find? The original use was a lumber yard. Which was awesome. Which is awesome because we're going to be doing a timber building there. And it, and it really truly inspired us to really think about, you know, how would lumber express itself within the building, you know? Um, that connectivity is something that we, we work on and we worked on in Nashville. Um, we've got a 20 acre site there with AJ Capital, our client. And the first building was an existing building um, called May Hosiery. It's a heavy timber building built in 1910, and they made socks for the military. A million, million socks a week. Oh, my goodness. Um, it was in pretty bad shape. We gutted it. It was kind of like a L shape. I put a huge pool out there, worked with Soho House like we always do with their designers and art designers. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. It is the largest Soho House in the world. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And across the street was, is the first mass timber building in Nashville, and it's called Nashville Warehouse. It's about a 250,000 square foot office building anchored by Live Nation, uh, the concert company. Yeah. This, is, this was a kind of a sleepy, neglected neighborhood that is called WeHo, south of downtown. It's along the freight lines, and uh, as I said, it was we were very comfortable with dealing with a master plan and a site in a neighborhood like this, because that's what we've done our whole life: is work on vernacular buildings along working railroads, industrial areas that moved out, they moved to the suburbs, and uh, so in our master plan, we took a look at what was there. Um, how to t do a new take on what is the best historical aspects of the area. And we wanted to create a neighborhood square. So there's going to be a big square with a shopping district. And, and there, was a, there was a Victorian home in the way. And somebody said, well, you know, let's just tear it down. We go, no, you know what? Let's hang on to it. Maybe we can move it, scooch it over to the edge of the square. It happened to be the old recording studio for the band, The Kings of Leon. And um, so um, that's phase two. The square is going to be built. The Victorian home will be at the, the end of the lawn. Um, there's going to be retail. There's going to be residential. It's a perfect example of how you can look at what was there in the past, preserve your existing buildings, renovate your heavy timber buildings, build new bass buildings that are inspired by that, and create a wonderful, walkable neighborhood. And I didn't mention it, but of course, we'll add all the green and sustainable elements to this. And I think that people, back to your point about yeah, you know what? People found that they really liked this type, these type of buildings and this kind of environment. Um, and uh, just to make it green and, and, and parts of it made from trees is even better. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I really must say that I think that your guys' interior design studio is one of the best in the country and maybe even in the world. Um, we could contend. Or as but I'm not gonna that, argue yeah. with you. Uh my partner our selling Navarra is, is amazing and she runs that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's been that was honestly one of the big reasons why we really liked you guys for Edison was because of all the like kind of background work you did on looking at the history of the site and understanding the vernacular of the area and then having that translate to the interiors, because I think that sometimes architects in, in our industry kind of forget about the interiors and they really focus on the massing and facade and the look and feel from the exterior, but then they forget that on a human scale, 
most of the time they spend indoors and that some of these massing moves might not even matter to the daily occupant of the building. Yeah, and so you, I, you know, it, it's no accident. Um, um, if you have heard of Studio 54 in New York, then you know who Ian Schrager was. Ian Schrager was uh, one of the inventors of the boutique hotel. Um, he was tired of um, innocuous business hotels, and he brought... Uh, he brought his friends who were artists and he bought their artwork and he hung it up in his hotels and he hired the best interior designers to stimulate his guests, um, to inspire them, to make them feel special. And when we started, um, our interiors group back in like 1998, we, we decided we want to do that. We want to think artistically. You know, we want to bring um, some emotion, um, some texture, some scale to um, to our interiors. And and if we can enhance the story of the site and the architecture and make it all connected, even better. Yeah, and I think especially for, I mean, boutique hotels, but also our business of residential multifamily housing, it's so critical to execute that right because it's people's homes at the end of the day and they're living in these spaces and it's not just a, an office building where they're going for part of their week they're spending most of their week in these spaces and i think having them really beautifully designed is something critical to the success of the building so well you, you know we've talked about this briefly before nate when i got into doing um apartment buildings back in the late 90s, I, I did a demographic study, and my perception of apartment development back there was um, landlords gaining their profit on spending less and less on their properties and making them more banal. And uh, in the early 2000s, we flipped that around, especially in the, in the luxury market. We started deciding, hey, maybe we'll spend a little bit more and definitely spend some creativity on the design, especially in the interiors, because you know, if we were rehabbing a building, that's where you could do some things, not on the outside. Um, spend a little bit more, make it more creative, make it more inviting, make it more visually stimulating. And what, what did we find out? Started commanding more rent. And that's when the uh, amenitization of apartment buildings and real estate really took off. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, when I look at what we're doing now and, and what's on the board for the future, I, I think it's a nice combination of being really creative, being really user-friendly, and maybe using timber and wood and being really healthy and sustainable too. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think that kind of that next generation of not merely focusing on the interiors, even though that's important, but also then focusing on the sustainability of the building and also the health and well being of the residents and figuring out how we can redesign HVAC systems and have better water and have better access to fitness and things like that and better food that whole experience is really gonna set some buildings apart, which hopefully ours is one of them, and other buildings not not so much so, because it's, I think that's what people are desiring. It's like people wanna live in healthy places and they wanna have more healthy lifestyles. So if you can deliver a product that has that kind of next wave of service, you're gonna be heads and shoulders over the competitors in the market. Yeah, do you, you, you um... Right now, the only path to getting a control over the temperature of the planet is with timber. I don't know of any real viable commercial building material that can do what timber does, which is basically, you know, cut your embodied carbon in half. And, um, you know, we've, we've been tracking the carbon, um, and, and the performance of our buildings over the last 10 years, you know, we're a part of 
AIA 2030 program. And what uh, the re most recent report is, we're not going to meet the goal of controlling the temperature of the planet the way we want it to. We're not there. But if we could scale up, you know, if we could build a lot more buildings out of, of sustainable timber and do what you're saying, try to work on the operational carbon as well, we could catch up and really start to slow down the uh, temperature increase that we're after in, the, in, in that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Transitioning to our last segment, because I know we only have about 10 minutes left. I uh, want to talk a little bit about kind of where you started and also just your core philosophy in regards to classical design and vernacular architecture. I think maybe for some of our audience who aren't architects, and I know we have a lot of those people, could you just describe quickly uh, what classical architecture is? Sure. Yeah, classical architecture is Western architecture that um, derives from the uh, the Greek and Roman orders. You know, if you guys have heard of Doric and Ionic columns were on temples, that is a system of, those are created through a system of portion um, that then can be applied to an entire building. You know, window sizes in proportion, um, roof lines, um, bottoms of the buildings, the tops of the buildings. Um, and uh, if the, what's interesting to me is I've thought, uh, I, I, I think classicism has got a bad rap, you know, that classical buildings are elitist buildings. But you have to remember that classical buildings are meant to be for people in the democracy of Athens or the democracy of Washington, D.C. They represent um, freedom and um, a place, place for everybody, inclusion. Um, and uh, so when Jim and I were trained in the classical language, we, um, we, we, we used it um, when when we could on our buildings. Now, we do a lot of modern buildings as well because we don't rely on classicism. Um, it, uh, if a particular site has an is interesting, um, something that inspires us, like we're, we're, we're doing, we just finished 400 apartments in the Gulch in Nashville called Albion the Gulch. And the gulch is on a curved ridge against curved highways, and the building is curved and very modern. Um, but, um, you know, what we found over time is that classicism, and there's different levels of it, um, uh, there's a kind of a universal appeal to, to it by people. And I think basically because it has great scale, um, and I talked about the buildings that we renovate timber buildings. Those are low classical buildings. They, they're of the same lineage, but they're very um, simple, unadorned, functional buildings um, that have a nice appeal. And we started doing low classical buildings, mid classical buildings, ground up, brand new now, and they have sort of an, a, a modern feel to them, industrial feel to them, uh, industrial modern, I guess. And um, we found that those are very, um, you know, uh, people like them, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've heard uh, one another architect describe classical architecture as in very simple terms is that they always have a base, a middle, and a top language to them. And so that's always like, I always go around looking at buildings and I'm like, is that a classical building? I don't know. But is that a is that a good kind of indicator for the layman or non architect? You look at a B yeah. and say, okay, it has a base, middle, and top. Yeah, um, I think there's historical reasons for that um, because it can change your perception of the building and and uh, you know how you relate to it. Um, scale it down for 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 us as humans. Um, the thing that I 
like to tell people is that classical architecture can be very versatile. It can really range from very stripped down to very ornate. And, you know, architects over the centuries have played and put their own brand onto classical architecture. Um, but I go back to the point of looking at the past for solutions to the future. That's what we found as a company, not just inventors of something brand new, but innovators. That is taking something that exists and transforming it into uh, something new, um, being inspired by the past. And that's why I think, you know, I, um, and you know, I owe that to my, my mentors from the Chicago seven, making us look at the past, looking at places for people, um, that, uh, that have a human scale. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of what I think about when I think about working in mass timber, it's like the solution yeah. to our, our crisis, our environmental crisis is hiding in plain sight. Yeah. You know, it's a tree and uh, the trees have been around a long time. Yeah, it is interesting how sometimes the solution is so obvious, but sometimes hard to actually reach. Um, well, thanks for coming on, Ray. I really enjoyed this conversation that we had today. If uh, any of our audience wants to find you, I'll, I'll link your website so that they can reach out and have any additional questions or just look at some of your work more. But I uh, really appreciate you coming on and joining the podcast. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ray. Talk to you next time. So well. At The Neutral Project, we're not just building structures. We're building a legacy of sustainability, helping align your investments with a sustainable future. We'd like to thank you for being part of this conversation. For more information and to stay up to date on how we're reshaping the future through environmentally conscious development, visit our social media accounts or our website at theneutralproject.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on The Neutral Podcast.